<clears throat> well, it's my duty this afternoon to try to keep you awake. Since I have a captive audience, I figured I might as well preach too. <clears throat> my message is on the reapers. <clears throat> and uh, I would just, I'll just start out with just reading the text here. This is found in Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest I will say the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then down to verse 37. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Then in Matthew chapter 24, starting at verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. In the Mark chapter 13, Pretty much the same passage is repeated here. I won't read that because it's, it's pretty close to the same exact words. When we think about the coming of the Lord, we must think about consummation. Amen. It's a time when all things are going to come together. It's a time when God is going to wrap up this, his present work. Everything's coming together. Everyone and everything is going to be involved in this great consummation at Christ's coming. All things come together for better or for worse, whether good or evil, to damnation or to eternal life. No personality will be left out. No thing will be left out. Every star in every galaxy that is in the heavens will be there, passing away with a great noise. The sea will give up her dead and the dry land. The earth and everything in it will melt with a holy fire that has never been seen. There will be a resurrection of all the dead, either to life or damnation. And these tabernacles of flesh will drop off and be cast away like an old tattered garment. Sinners will be crying and wailing to be hidden from the day of awful wrath. Saints will be shouting, singing, and rejoicing for the day that has finally come. And Christ himself shall appear in power and great glory, along with all of his saints. And as this old corrupt earth and heavens flee from his presence, a new heavens and a new earth will begin to dawn undefiled and incorruptible in their place. Satan and his army of evil will in one fell swoop be overcome and cast down to the sides of the pit forever. The coming of our Lord will be an awesome display of power and glory and might and the wisdom of God. From the most immature infant in its mother's womb to the mightiest angel in heaven to the most distant star in the galaxy, all things are going to be involved in the coming of the Lord. It's a great consummation. And certainly the angels have a part in this coming. I want to start right from the outset here. I want to say that this has to be approached with some degree of caution, both for me and for you, the hearers of this message. 
I don't want to be guilty of tempting someone to fall into worship of the angels or some such thing. We don't want to have an inordinate affection or attention to the angels. Nevertheless, it is, they are an important part of the gospel and certainly the coming of the Lord. There have been a lot of false ideas propagated in recent years about the angels. They have been used for great commercial success even. They've been relegated to the list of superstitious things like gnomes and elves and fairies. They've been idolized, worshipped, prayed to. Just a few days ago, I had a coworker send me some email with a uh, picture made up of keyboard characters into an angel with a blessing attached. It would guarantee my safety and happiness if I forwarded it to five other people. So there are a lot of false ideas out there about the holy angels, and I'm sure you know that. But let's keep the angels in the perspective of the scriptures. We'll be safe there. Let's be cautious that our thoughts are in keeping with the Word of God. Now, the holy angels are not the center of attention in the Word of God. Amen. They're not at the center of attention at the Lord's coming. However, it is the, the focus of my message. So, I, uh, as I said, I do approach this with a degree of caution. It's not necessary that we know everything about the angels, and just what little we know from the Scriptures is sufficient. I think that if more people had an accurate view of the holy angels, that it would cause more a spirit of fear than it would carnal curiosity. I can assure you without any reservation that the angels are not cute, chubby little babies that shoot love arrows into people. In the book of the Revelation, John saw a mighty angel come from heaven, and he was clothed with the cloud and had a rainbow on his head, and his face was as the sun and his feet pillars of fire. And again in chapter 18, he saw another angel come down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Just one angel. In chapter 19, he saw an angel standing in the sun. Now we know that angels have taken on the form of men, such as when they delivered Lot from Sodom and when they visited Abraham, but that's not their normal state. The holy angels have been created with great power and authority and glory. And this is going to be the main thrust of my message today. That the, the angels have been given great power and authority. And this will come into play at the Lord's coming. <clears throat> in Isaiah chapter 6, you know this passage. When King, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah went to the temple. Perhaps Isaiah said to himself in the way of the temple, I hope I have a positive worship experience this morning. And when he opened the door there, the temple was filled with the glory of God. And he saw two seraphims, each with six wings. Two wings they covered their faces, and with two wings they covered their feet, and with two wings they flew. And one seraphim cried to the other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And as, just as Isaiah was falling flat on his face in the temple floor, he happened to notice just before he hit the floor that the foundations of the temple doorposts had moved from the sound of this angel's voice. That was just one angel. And to tell you the truth, I think he probably kept the volume down in consideration of Isaiah. <clears throat> so I can tell you that the holy angel's ministry is to do the will of the Father. It's not to do what we want, what men want. They are his angels, not our angels. Amen. The angels were created. <clears throat> As the scriptures say, he maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. In the book of Job, the angels are referred to as the sons of God. I like that. That makes them our brethren. We know that we were created a little lower than the angels, and that they excel in strength, and that they are greater in power and might. I think that men in general by far underestimate the power and authority that God has given to the holy angels. Let's not have any part with cutesy views of the holy angels. Amen. We may tend to forget that we were created lower than them. Now, the angels are not thoughtless machines. I, I don't know if, if you've been guilty of this. I confess I have. For some reason, I had a mindset that the angels were almost like robots, that the Lord just commands them and they go and do something or... He commands them to come and they come, but we're going to see here that that's not the case at all. Have you ever stopped to think that the angels have desires? They desire to look into these things, the scriptures say. Now, it's difficult for us to imagine angels 
because we know that they are creations of the Father. They are created more powerful, more glorious than us. They don't have a carnal nature. They're not mortal like us. It's difficult for us to, to conceive of them having free will and making choices and yet not having to fend off some lower nature or some carnal wishes. That's hard for us to understand, I think. But on the other hand, think of the angels looking at us. What a great mystery they see, the mortals burdened with a sinful nature, being made sons and daughters of God, granted life and immortality, and promised to inherit the kingdom of God. And truly, they desire to look into these things. But now their focus is not so much on us and what we are doing as what God is doing. Amen. That's what the angels are beholding. They are his angels. And angels have personalities. It's obvious from biblical accounts that they know and do the will of the Father. And you'll never read where there's a, a long string of explicit step-by-step-by-step -step -step instructions given to the angels. They just go and they do it. And I, I think that they have, a, they use... For lack of a better term, they have creative and innovative abilities. I mean, you and I do. Why wouldn't they? We're created lower than the angels. Surely they have more uh, of an abundance and glorious nature than what we have. They're much uh, on a much higher order. The, the language used in the Word of God suggests that there is some sort of hierarchy among the angelic hosts. There's cherubims, seraphims, archangels. There are particular references to strong angels and a mighty angel. Now what we want to see in the creation and the role of the angels is something about God himself. Don't get too hung up on the angels that you miss the one who created them. Amen. That's the thing we want to see. Could God do, with the angel, would do without the angels? Certainly he could, just like he can do without you and me. But we see something in the nature of God in this, that he wants angels. He made angels, and he made you and me, and there's a reason for that. We see the, the, the person of God in this. It's his nature to glorify himself by extending himself to his creation, to his sons and his daughters. I speak as a man here, but the, the attitude of God is like, why should I do this wonderful thing myself when I can share this with my offspring? Let them do it. Let them glorify my name. That's, that's a wonderful thing to consider. Amen. Now to continue on with a more accurate view of the angels, let's go to the scriptures. <clears throat> and notice the way that the angels are depicted in the scriptures by the settings that they're placed in. Again, they're given great power and authority. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, this is where David disobeyed the Lord and numbered the children of Israel and the punishment that was upon the, the children of Israel, there was, was an angel coming and stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem. And within three days' time, 70,000 men died. But that was nothing compared to the 185,000 of Sennacherib's host that one angel slew just overnight. Men and even armies of men are no match for the holy angels. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. God has chosen to be identified with the holy angels. Now that's very significant. God doesn't identify himself with just any person. The Lord reigneth. Let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims. Let the earth be moved. In Ezekiel's vision, he heard the sound of cherubims' wings, and he said that it was as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaketh. That was just cherubims flying. <laughs> the angels are privy to the throne. Think about that. They see and know the glory of God. And Gabriel identified himself to Zacharias, saying, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. Amen. Now notice these statements of, of uh, the Lord Jesus. Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. Paul charged Timothy before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels. I see just the way that the context that the angels are put in, they are very significant. The Lord, the Holy Spirit doesn't just take things and put them in a context like what I just read there. The angels are, are very powerful. They have great authority and significance in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> but in addition to these details scattered throughout the scriptures, Let's go to the book of the Revelation where we'll get a much clearer picture of the role of the angels. 
You recall in the first few chapters there, there were some letters written to seven churches. And if you read those carefully there in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, they were actually written to the angels of the churches. Well, that seems kind of strange. Why would the Lord write letters to the angels of the churches? Because that was those angels' responsibility. Again, I speak as a man here, but it, the Lord said, here's, here's this church, here's the good parts they have, here's their faults. Angel of Sardis, you handle that. It's your church, you handle it. Angel of Thyatira, here's your responsibility. Here's my letter, my, le my message to this church, you handle it. See, this is the way the Lord is using his angels. <clears throat> Then in chapter 5 of the book of the Revelation, you recall there that the book was held out and there was a search made for a worthy man to open the book. And this book had great importance and an angel held the book. And then when the book was opened, angels dispensed the things that were found in the book. We read about an angel who stood upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are therein and the earth and the things that are in and the sea and the things which are in, that there should be time no longer. That was an angel. In the book of the Revelation, generally the angels are the ones calling most of the shots under the headship of Christ. You just skim through the book of Revelation, you'll see that. <clears throat> there are four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. There are seven angels who are given the se seven trumpets, and they are given the seven plagues and the seven vials of wrath. An angel gives the command to thrust in the sickle to reap the earth. And it's an angel that thrusts in the sickle. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels and cast them out into the earth. An angel had the key to the bottomless pit. Another angel carried John away in the spirit and showed him that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And at the twelve gates to that great city, there were, you guessed it, twelve angels. And finally, I want to use a negative example to show the power that God has given the angels. Consider Satan's power. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? This one angel once had so much power that he was able to influence an entire section of the heavenly host into following him in rebellion against God. That's not something to envy, brethren, but I, I use that to illustrate my point of the power of the angels. God created him that way, that the angels have some power, brethren. <clears throat> and he also, with his army of demons, has enticed every man ever born to sin, except for one who is his creator and destroyer. But when our Lord returns again, there's not going to be any battle of angel against angel. There's not going to be any battle of good against evil. No one shall be able to abide the day of his coming. No evil personality will be able to stand when he appeareth, for he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. You may ask, now how do you know there's not going to be any angelic battle when the Lord comes? Because I read in the book of Daniel where Daniel's angel fought for 21 days against the prince of Persia just to bring a message to Daniel. And I also read about Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon and his angels in the book of the Revelation. Now when the Lord comes, isn't there going to be a some kind of big battle against these powers? My answer is this, that the old serpent is in for a big surprise. The powers of wickedness have no idea of the glory of the coming of the Lord. Praise God, we can see it by faith. I don't know if the old serpent has ever seen Christ in the fullness of his glorified state. I suspect that he has not, but that's my opinion. But I do know that he hasn't seen him come in his glory and with all the holy angels in their glory. I can tell you that all that funny business about the world being destroyed by nuclear bombs is a gross failure to know the glory of the Lord. Amen. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. When he appears, the earth and the heaven will flee away from his face. There will be no place found for the things that can be shaken in the radiance of his glory. 
And not only that, but when he appears, we shall all be changed. For we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The old deceiver hasn't seen us glorified yet. When we are gathered together with him and with all the O holy angels, each of us glorified together with Christ, clothed with incorruption, glory, and power, there aren't going to be any contentions, no objections, no arguments, no battles. Not even a word will have to be spoken. Our enemies, enemies will be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. These old pitchers of clay are going to be broken open, and the light of the glory of God is going to shine forth as we proclaim the sword of the Lord. Amen. You recall the picture there with Gideon. There wasn't much fighting going on there when uh, Gideon won that battle. The wicked will be like grasshoppers and locusts, which camp in the hedges during the cold day, but when the sun ariseth, they flee away, and their place is not found where they are. They will be like the chaff which, driveth, which the wind driveth away. Let them be as chaff before the wind, and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Consider that the fallen's angel, fallen angel's time is short. Consider that when he is finally cast down to the sides of the pit, we shall narrowly look upon him. And consider him saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble? Is this the man that, shake, that shook the kingdoms and made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof? that open not the house of his prisoners? And yet consider one more marvelous thing, that when our Lord returns to receive us unto himself, our glory will exceed that of the angels. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man, that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man, that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. Amen. I thrill to think of the innumerable company that will make up the eternal throng when our Lord returns. What an exceedingly large and beautiful building is being built upon Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. For God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. He was in the beginning with God, and he was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and he is the head of all principality and power. He is the head from which all the body, by joints and bands, having nourishment, ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. He who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. He who laid the cornerstone thereof, and when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. For unto the which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. And again, when did he ever say to the angels, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son? But when he bringeth his first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And now, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish but thou remainest. And they shall all wax old as doth the garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years fail not. Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice. Let men say among the nations, The Lord reigneth. Let the sea roar, and the fullness thereof. Let the fields rejoice, and all that is therein. Then shall the trees of the woods sing out at the presence of the Lord because he cometh to judge the earth. The Lord reigneth, let the earth rejoice. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of the nations, and all the ends of the world shall see the salvation of our God. Amen. One day soon this man is coming back to judge the world and to take himself a bride. Now you can believe that's going to be a glorious event, brethren. When the firstborn of all creation comes to take him a bride, <clears throat> It's not going to be any secret. 
May God grant us the faith to see the glory of that splendid moment when he shall come again <clears throat> in his glory and the glory of his Father <clears throat> and all the holy angels and all his glorified saints. There must be a reaping because God has been sowing <clears throat> and Satan has been planting tares. The sower didn't sow seed because he likes farming. <clears throat> God is looking for some wheat and he has grown some wheat. The fully matured product is the point of God's work on earth. Satan's, Satan is planting tares, so there's got to be a reaping. The reason for the harvest is to get the tares out of the way, to remove the corruption. And this is the specialty of the angels. Amen. In the book of the Revelation, John saw a vision of him that sat upon the throne holding a book that was written within and on the back side. Now this is not a story book. And it's not a history book. It's not a book of instructions. This book that the Father had this angel hold in his right hand contained his will for the future, the things which must shortly come to pass. It contains the things of the last times. And note that God sought for a worthy man to open this book. Now the book was not to be opened so that someone could read it. It wasn't to be opened for the absorption of information. The book had to be opened to dispense the will of God. Therefore, the opening of the book was no small matter. It was to be accomplished by only one who was worthy of such a marvelous and great honor. And note that he did not seek an angel. He didn't say, someone open the book. Someone who is worthy. He said, no, seek a worthy man. I want a man to dispense my kingdom. Amen. Think about that. <clears throat> There was no man in heaven, nor on earth, neither under the earth, that was worthy to open the book. In fact, we are told that there was no man worthy even to look at the things that were on the book. But of course, we know that someone prevailed, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the Prince of the kings of the earth. It is him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. <clears throat> I want us to see how perfectly reasonable and consistent and right this is that Jesus Christ is the worthy man who opened the book. Now don't just automatically assume that Jesus is worthy because he holds a certain position in the kingdom of God. I'm telling you, brethren, that he earned this. Our Savior was qualified. He earned the right to open the book. <clears throat> Who could better administer God's will for the end times, to strengthen and keep safe the church, to marshal the heavenly army, to control the powers of evil, to see that the Father is glorified in all things? Who else could do this? The wisdom and skill required for this task are the trademarks of Jesus Christ. He already had a proven record of administering the Father's will, for all things were created by him. And he is the firstborn of every creature, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. This is the one that was worthy to loose the seals and to open the book and to administer the things that are in it. Amen. The supernatural cosmic and divine power required for this task belong only to Jesus Christ. He had attained this glory by reconciling all things in heaven and earth unto the Father. I speak as a man, but this is his specialty. It bears his trademark. Worthy is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. I want you to see that this is not at all irrelevant to my message. The same kingdom principle applies to the ministry of the angels also. It's not just coincidental that the angels are the reapers. It wasn't because there wasn't anyone else, anyone else around to do it and God decided to just pick the angels. No, it, the same principle, the reason that Christ opened the book is because he earned it, he was qualified to do it, and the same case is so with the angels we're going to see. <clears throat> the angels are the reapers. It's their trademark. The work that's required in the reaping is the distinction and territory of the angels. Now, the earth has been the focus of God's work for the past six millennia of time as we know it. It is where he has chosen to plant his seed, 
and he has appointed his angels to be ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Therefore, we must reason that the earth, its inhabitants, and the things that affect us are the primary focus of the angels' ministry, at least for the present time. Now, that's not to say that the angels have no ministry in heaven. After all, heaven is their home, and they are God's ministers. What I am saying is that God has given the stewardship of ministering to the saints unto the angels, and this is an exceeding large ministry. He did not make his angels a flame of fire for nothing. Again, let's go to the scriptures just to make sure I'm not making this up. <clears throat> you recall a situation here in 2 Kings chapter 6 with Elisha, where the king of Syria sought after Elisha's life because uh, the prophet Elisha was instrumental in the Syrians not being able to defeat the Israelites. And Elisha was in a little city of Dothan, and overnight the Syrians encompassed the city. And 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And a servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, Open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Amen. Now, I want to focus on this example here just for a few minutes because we're going to draw a few things from this. You read on further and you find out that uh, <clears throat> Elisha prayed and the Syrian army was struck blind and he led them into Samaria and he restored their sight and fed them a meal and sent them home, which is like the ultimate humiliation for the Eastern soldier. But uh, there's some interesting questions that that brings up. There's no battle. <clears throat> now we know that angels are very powerful. Just one angel could have been sufficient to take care of the whole Syrian army. And yet they were there in great number. The mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. And another question, if Elisha, if Elisha only needed to pray to resolve the situation, why were the angels there at all? Because he prayed and everything was taken care of, and that was it. So why were they there? I'm convinced that there was such a great heavenly host gathered there because they wanted to be. They are there gathered around Elisha, undergirding and protecting the man of God. They had an interest in the situation there and in Elisha. And I don't mean, by interest, I don't mean curiosity. I mean they had a stake in it. It was their, it was their ministry. It was their responsibility. They are ministers under the heirs of salvation. Elisha was their ward and their responsibility. I think that when God's people meet with opposition, that the angelic force is there to undergird the cause of God. I think we underestimate the activity of the heavenly host how our conduct would change if we were more aware of the innumerable company that is around us. We would be more bold, more confident, more vigilant, more reverent of God. Sermons and prayers would be more carefully crafted to be profitable and edifying. Singing would be more joyous and exuberant. We would be more careful of how we treat brothers and sisters in Christ and strangers. Let's look at a few other scriptures also that you're, you're probably familiar with these, but I want to bring them up again, refresh your mind with these. You recall in the book of Genesis, chapters 16 and 21, that the angels of the Lord found Hagar and Ishmael. In Genesis 19, two angels came to destroy the cities of the plain. That was their primary mission, destroy the cities, but they delivered Lot first. The angel stopped Abraham from slaying Isaac. When Jacob blessed his sons, he spoke of the angel which redeemed me from all evil. The angel of, the God, of God went before the camp of Israel and kept them in the way. Angels have prophesied to God's people and to Israel in Judges chapter 2, to Samson's parents, to Elijah, Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, to Zechariah. They delivered messages to Philip, Cornelius, and John. The angels interpreted Zechariah's vision and John's vision. Indeed, the angel of the Lord encampeth around about them that fear him and delivereth them. And they are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Amen. But now that's not the only ministry of the angels. 
The angels are also depicted in the scriptures as being the guardians of the holy, holy place, of the holy God, of God's holy people. We see this especially in the tabernacle and in the temple. There were, if you read the construction there, there were many cherubs all throughout the workings of the, of the temple in the woodwork, and they were uh, structures built in their likeness. Probably the most well-known are the cherubs that overlooked, overlooked the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat, shall the faces of the cherubims be. God spoke to Moses from between the two, two cherubims, and over and over again, especially in the Old Testament scriptures, God is referred to as the God that dwelleth between the cherubims. <clears throat> they are identified as the ones that cover God's dwelling place. The great thick veil that separated the holy of holies from the rest of the tabernacle had cunning cherubims of cunning work woven into it. No one ever yet passed into God's presence without going through the angels first. To this day, they are witnesses and the guardians of the holy and sacred things of God, whether it's a people, a place, or God himself. You remember that Herod gave a great speech and failed to give glory, glory to God, and immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not glory to God. Amen. Paul warned certain unruly women in Corinth that they ought to be subject to authority because of the angels. Those who would usurp authority and who would dare to trample on the holy and sacred things of God had better be aware of the angels. He maketh his ministers a flame of fire. So we see, brethren, that the heavens are teeming with activity. The angels have a very broad ministry. The innumerable, com innumerable company is not just hovering over us watching. They are busy working, ministering, protecting, revealing, battling. They have been busy going about the works of the kingdom of God at least since the beginning of time as we know it. They have not ceased or slowed down the slightest. The angels have tirelessly invested themselves in the kingdom of God, and in particular, they have done so in our behalf, the heirs of salvation. For nearly 7,000 years of time, they've been vigorously active in the earth, jealously guarding and protecting the people of God, fending off the powers of evil, joining with us in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, sparing us from dangers, carrying the souls of God's dear children to the bosom of the Savior, revealing the Father's will and meeting out his judgments. They too have been laborers in God's field. The angels have witnessed the good seed being sown, and they saw it sprout up and grow. And they protected and helped the tender young plants, and they've also witnessed the growth and proliferation of the tares in their own territory. They've seen the domain of their ministry corrupted and spoiled by the enemy. The angels long for the day when that voice comes from heaven, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. Yes, it is fitting that the angels be the reapers. Amen. They have made a personal investment in this vineyard, and it is consistent with the kingdom of God that they have a part in its reaping. Amen. The angels will be the ones to divide the wheat from the tares. In the words of our Lord, they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. And they shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. The threshing floor is going to be thoroughly purged. Not a single grain of wheat will be harmed, and not a single bit of chaff will escape the unquenchable fire. And we know this is true because the angels are the reapers. Woe to the tares on that day. Then the wicked will know that the face of the Lord has been against them. He will cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. Woe to those evil ones that have tormented and vexed the heirs of salvation. Woe to them that have imprisoned, punished, discouraged and done harm to faithful preachers and teachers of the gospel. Woe to them that gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemn innocent blood. For he has given his angels charge over them, and the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him. Their names were confessed before the Father and the holy angels, and those angels are the reapers. Amen. Woe to the rejecters of his grace and love, and woe to them that judge themselves unworthy of eternal life. For the angels desired to look into these things and to see God's name glorified. The angels are witnesses of what God is doing in heaven and in earth. They've witnessed God's great love and mercy, and they've witnessed some men rejected. 
Jesus Christ spread his gospel throughout the whole earth through his apostles, who were made a spectacle unto the world and unto angels. And those witnessing angels are going to be the reapers. Woe to them that have used the pulpit as a means of deceit and personal profit. Woe to them that have perverted and hidden the truth from the masses and fastened the minds of people to the earth. Woe to them that supplant the gospel of Jesus Christ with fun and entertainment. For the law was given by the disposition of angels. The revelation of Jesus Christ was given by an angel. And unto an angel was given the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And Jesus himself sent his angel to testify unto us these things in the churches. And those angels are the reapers. Woe to the child abusers. Woe to the baby murderers. Woe to all those who mistreat and neglect and steal a child's innocence from him. Woe to them that have ruined and spoiled the little one's lives by exposing their tender young hearts and minds to the depths of evil and human depravity. How many millions and millions of little ones have been born to the Father's bosom on the wings of angels? How many times have the innumerable company of angels witnessed unspeakable things involving children? Woe to them that are guilty of such things, for I say unto you that in heaven there are angels. To always behold the face of our Father. Amen. And those angels are the reapers. Woe to them that have despised the Lord's Christ. Of how much sore punishment <clears throat> suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. I am talking about the one who laid the cornerstone of creation. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. For when he bringeth in the first begotten in the world, he saith, Let all the angels of God worship him. It was an angel that named him Jesus before he was conceived in the womb. And a multitude of the heavenly hosts gave glory to God at his birth. The holy angels watched over our Savior every moment of his earthly life and guarded his every footstep. They saw him live an ignoble life among men. They saw him when he came to save and go without even the basic needs of human existence. When he was tempted after going without food and water for 40 days in the wilderness, then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. And those angels are the reapers. Woe to them that have no reverence for the only begotten on that day. Woe to the New Age theologian, the stand-up comic, who mocks and jokes at the sufferings of Christ. For when he prayed there all alone in the garden, Sweating, as it were, great drops of blood and great agony, overbecoming sin for those who mocked him. There appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Yes. And that angel will be among the reapers. Woe to those that have espoused lifeless and godless religion. To those who are always seeking one more sign of the truth. For when our Savior rose from the dead, the angel of the Lord ascended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. An angel led him out of the tomb, and the angels proclaimed that he is alive. He was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, and now is gone into the heaven and is on the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Woe to them that have rejected his truth, for these same witnessing angels are the reapers. It is right that the angels be the reapers. They have had a part in this work of God from the very beginning. They've labored in the vineyard. They've earned the right to be the reapers. Amen. They are going to divide, to divide the wheat from the chaff and purge the threshing floor. Those that reject the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels Amen. and in the presence of the Lamb. Not only are the angels going to gather the tares and the bundles to be burned, but praise the Lord, they are also gather, going to gather the wheat into the garner and we shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other just as the angels spared the lot from the burning destruction of the cities of the plains they're going to be there to ensure our safety and deliverance Amen. and oh what a blessed union finally united with our real family face to face with those that we've only seen with the eye of faith. We'll see our beloved Savior, our bridegroom, arrayed in splendorous glory, come to save us and take us into the wedding feast. 
We will meet him in the air along with all of our glorified brethren, the patriarchs, the prophets, the apostles, the martyrs, friends that we once had fellowship with here in this life. And we'll finally see our friends and brethren in Christ, the holy angels. I know that they will not be the preeminent personalities on that day, but still I cannot help but desire to meet and a fellowship with the ones that have kept us and ministered unto us by the grace of God. Truly the holy angels have been and always will be our dear companions and co-laborers in the kingdom of God. I think the holy angels also look forward to the reaping of the wheat. <clears throat> I was wondering, do you ever wonder about some of the details of Christ's second coming like I do? I thought about our meeting in the air, and I wonder if we'll have the ability to fly, or will the angels convey us to his side? I know that we are going to judge our enemies, and the scriptures plainly say that we shall judge angels, that is the fallen angels. I wonder just how the tares are going to be bundled, and how the judgment will proceed. I wonder if we'll be able to find our way around the new heavens and the new earth at first. And if I want to be with a certain saint to start a great and glorious work or to converse with Joseph or Jeremiah or Anna or Timothy, will I be able to find them or will they be busy involved in some work at the time? I feel much more easy about all those kinds of details knowing that the angels will be there with us. The angels know the things that we have not been privy to on this side of the dark glass, things that we only know by faith they've been observing for a millennia of time. On that day, there's going to be a cosmic transition that will affect us forever. And praise the Lord, our brethren, the angels, are going to be the reapers. Praise the Lord that our friends, the holy angels that have known us and ministered to us all of our lives, will be the ones to gather us together from the uttermost part of earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Amen. It's good to know that our ministers that are going to sever the wicked from the just are acutely aware of the difference. They have fought against our enemies and have ministered good things to us. Praise the Lord. The angels are the reapers. I know that I speak about these things as an ignorant and unglorified man from this side of heaven. But one thing that I am confident of, <clears throat> that the holy angels will continue to fulfill a vital role in the world to come, a glorious role regarding the heirs of salvation. And I do look forward to working together with them. What marvelous and glorious works will we be engaged with, with them in? Amen. We are all united in glorious liberty. Oh, how we will glorify the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. We, the sinners, reconciled to God, glorified and made co-heirs with Christ Jesus, working in concert with him and with each other and with his mighty ministering servants that he has made a flame of fire. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.